Thank you for that introduction. What you wouldn't get from that introduction is that I really see my life as having two chapters. Chapter one led me to be the president of a Fortune 100 energy company. <clears throat> but what you may be shocked to learn is in chapter one, I was living life by default. I was stressed out, so unhealthy that I ended up in a hospital bed with doctors telling me that I'm not going to make it, that I'm going to die. Now chapter two is where I left that hospital bed on a mission to design my life differently. A life of learning, a life of intention, a life of meaning, and a life of purpose. So today what I'll do is I'll give you a little background on myself so you get to know me a little better. I'm going to tell you about living these two chapters in my life and ultimately share with you five lessons that I learned from transitioning from living my life by default to living my life by design. So here we go. As Dr. Hersey, Hussey said, I grew up in Agua Dulce, Texas. It's about 20 miles north of here. It's a town of about 800 people. I went from kindergarten through high school there. I had 28 people in my graduating class. I barely made the top 10%. I was number two. <laughs> and Agua Dulce is a great place to grow up. My first job there, summer of my eighth grade year, Agua Dulce is surrounded by crop fields. So I worked for a farmer there. And one of my jobs was to walk down these long cotton rows and hoe weeds by hand. We'd drive tractors to harvest the crops. We would uh, work on machinery to keep everything running. It was long, hot, hard work. I did that six summers in a row, but I was so grateful, grateful for that job. Between that job, selling pigs at the annual livestock show and saving money, I was able to put myself through my first couple years here at the university. <clears throat> I'm a seventh generation South Texan, so deciding to go to this university, the best in South Texas, was by default a very easy decision. I have a long line of family that have attended here and graduated from here. The first one, my great, great Aunt Thelma Lindholm, graduated from here, one of the first graduates from Texas Teachers College in 1925. My mom attended here. I had aunts and uncles graduate from here. My dad graduated from Texas A&I with a few degrees and actually came back here and taught here after he retired from high school. He was the first one in his family that got a college education. Me and my sisters graduated from here. That makes us the fourth generation of family that have graduated from this university. So no matter the name of the university, we come from a long line of Havelinas. <clears throat> I remember how I became a chemical engineer. I was tired of working in the fields. So I came to my freshman advisor, I said, what's the highest paying job you could get with an undergraduate degree from this university? He said, chemical engineer. I said, perfect, sign me up. He handed me a degree plan, and I took every class that they told me to take on that degree plan, including both physical chemistries. And both those of you that passed physical chemistry to get here, God bless you, because I still have post-traumatic stress syndrome overtaking those classes. It was a wonderful time here, though. I got an internship somewhere around my sophomore year. That internship led me to working at a gas plant between here and Agua Dulce. So I got to work part-time while I put myself through the rest of college. And that led me to my first job. You know, when I graduated from here, my default plan was to work hard, make a lot of money, retire at 55, 60, and that was about my plan. Pretty simple. So my first job, I work seven days a week. It's a steep learning curve, as you'll learn whenever you get your first job tomorrow. Your learning curve is much more steep than it was in university. Uh, this is the commencement, the first day of your learning. So my first job, I, I, I worked in the oil field, and I was promoted very early on in my career. By 26 years old, I was put over South Texas again at the same gas plant where I was an intern. I had 100 employees. I was my youngest employee. And that's the way it was for the first part of my career. Every time they offered me a promotion, more responsibility, more money, higher up the corporate ladder, it was perfect. It met my default plan. It eventually led me to be the vice president. By 29 years old, I'm vice president of an oil and gas company in Dallas, Texas. I was recently married. 
I had a young newborn. And, and Dallas is where I was noticed by the CEO of a very large pipeline company. He came to me and offered me basically the top rung of a corporate ladder and more money than I thought I could make ever. He offered me the chief operating officer position for a publicly traded company. I'm 31 years old. I just walked you through 10 years of my career, 10 years deep, and I've already started approaching the peak of a corporate ladder. I thrived in that job. I did very well. Eventually, I was promoted to president. And that's what you heard at the beginning. I was promoted to president of a Fortune 100 company by the time I was 35 years old. So my paper resume looks absolutely awesome. I had over 1,000 employees. I had name notoriety. I was, I was working all the time. I was on a plane four days a week. I was never home to see my kid. But what's interesting about that, all that led to my default plan. But on the inside, I was spiritually empty. I was unfulfilled. And you may ask, how is that possible? How can you not be proud of a life like that when you're on top of a corporate ladder, making more money in a year than I thought I could make in 10 years? I was very self-centered, very insecure, stressed out. I used to drink a lot of alcohol as a crutch to deal with that. Somewhere along the way, I got a divorce from a very short and bad marriage. I moved out of my house into an apartment, apartment that's about the size of the one I had when I graduated university. Not many presidents of Fortune 100 companies live in apartments of that size. And it was in that apartment that I decided to change my life and do something a little bit differently. But I didn't know that I didn't change enough. But I did quit my job. I stepped off the corporate ladder. I had reached the highest point that you could get from graduation to that point, and I stepped off the corporate ladder. So for the first time in my life, I had no paycheck. But I wasn't done hitting bottom just yet. On my birthday, my girlfriend, which is now my beautiful and loving wife, had to take me to the hospital. I had severe abdominal pain. They told me that I had acute pancreatitis. And for those of you that don't know, your pancreas is the one organ you need to digest food. It controls your enzymes. It's horribly painful. They said that most people much older have a problem like that. So not only did I exceed uh, expectations in my career, I exceeded in unhealthy living as well. The way they treat that is they put you in a hospital bed. They fill you full of pain medicine. They don't want you to put anything in your, in your mouth, no food, no water. And you lay there and they hope you get better. After 10 days, a doctor came to me and says, hey, Mike, you're not looking too good, man. You're not going to make it. You're dying. My living by default, doing, living life however, had led me to almost dying. He said, well, tomorrow we're going to try a surgery on you. Not many people make it through the surgery. And I'm thinking, you know, I've made changes in my life. I know that I, I need to make some more. I'm too young to die. I was scared out of my mind. The next day, my numbers got a little bit better. The next day, my numbers got a little bit better. They let me out of the hospital after day 13 to go home and continue my recovery. And, you know, I decided to close chapter one right there and start writing chapter two. Chapter two, I decided to design my life, not just live by default, not just take it as it comes, but to design my life. So chapter two is a life of learning. Chapter two is a life of intention. Chapter two is a life of meaning and purpose. I had figured out how to die. Now I wanted to learn how to live. I work relentlessly to improve myself and also to help others to improve themselves. I'm enjoying where I'm going. I started a company. It's a meaningful endeavor. We started with eight people. We got 350 now. I'm very proud of where I am and proud of where I'm going. And so my gift to you today is to share with you five lessons that I've learned, not ones that I Googled, but ones that I learned from transitioning from living life by default to living life by design. I call them design lessons. Design lesson number one, where you come from does not determine where you're going. When I left this university, I had a chip on my shoulder for people that I thought were born on third, stealing home. They're from a bigger university or a bigger city. They had more opportunity than I did. I remember one time early on, I was at lunch with a, a boss of mine. He brought a guy from Harvard with him. He looks at me and says, hey, Mike, what was your GPA when you graduated from Texas A&M Kingsville? 
chemical engineer. I said, I don't know, about 3.75. He looks at the guy from Harvard and said, that's probably like a 3.0 at Harvard. And that's what they want you to believe. They want you to believe that you're less than. And just for your information, Harvard doesn't offer a chemical engineering degree, and they don't even calculate their GPAs the same way we do. So that guy didn't know what he's talking about. I have met a lot of successful people. And I met one just the other day, richest guy in Oklahoma, youngest of 13 children, son of a sharecropper. He started in the oil field driving trucks. Today he's a multi-billionaire and he doesn't have a college degree. Where you come from does not determine where you're going. Your upbringing does not define you. So remember, when designing your life, nothing's holding you back. Design lesson number two, never stop learning. I'll be honest with you, when I graduated from here, I said that I would never come back to school. I definitely wouldn't be talking to this big a crowd in this costume. But I was wrong. In chapter two, I've had to radically change my mindset towards learning. I now understand that you don't know it all. You have to keep learning. In chapter two, and this is, Late in my 30s, I started reading books, personal development books. I still read at least one a month. I hired a, a life coach to help me make change in my life because you can't make change in your life without a coach. I started to learn to have trust and a power greater than myself, so I learned how to pray and how to meditate. I stopped drinking alcohol and I learned how to stay stopped. I started hanging around successful people and attracting successful people because I finally figured out that you are the average of the five people that you keep around you. To say that differently is, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And I noticed that successful people set goals for themselves and they work to, to achieve those goals. They set time on a calendar. They don't just wake up in the morning and say, come on, day, bring it. No, they, they, they set tasks in their calendar. So I learned how to set a task in my calendar to achieve my goals. I started filling my mind with more positive information. I watch YouTube videos relentlessly on successful people, motivational speakers, personal development coaches like Tony Robbins, Eric Thomas, Alex Epstein, people that help me think better. Last year, I took a 52-week leadership course. I'm taking it again this year with 20 of my employees, and I'm the CEO. So when designing your life, you'll never know it all. Keep adding tools to your toolbox. Design lesson number three, think for yourself. I remember in chapter one, when I was living by default, I'd get into a car on my way to work, I'd turn on the radio, I'd listen to news, I'd listen to talk radio, I'd listen to Howard Stern doing something ridiculous. I'd get to the office and I'd let the computer uh, give notifications to me and interrupt my workflow in the day. I'd be lazily looking at my phone, letting social media and other things interrupt my day filling my mind with negative information. It really gave me a negative view of the world. I really started thinking that the world is heading in a really bad direction. But let me tell you something, in chapter two, I don't watch the news. I don't allow notifications to get into my mind. I take responsibility for what and when I let content get into my head. And to prove to you that the world is better than it ever has been in human history, and you won't get any of this from the news, because if you watch the news, you think everything's really bad. The World Health Organization this year has came out and said that there are less people living in abject poverty today on the planet than any other time in human history. Right now, there's less war and less violence worldwide than we've ever had in human history. We have more democracy globally than we've ever had. We have access to cleaner water and cleaner air than we've ever had access to, which means we have less disease, which means we're living longer as a species. We're living longer today than we did 20 years ago. We're living twice as long now as we did 100 years ago. There is no famine on the earth today, and that's astonishing when you consider we have 7.6 billion people living on the planet. We feed them every day. We couldn't do that 100 years ago. We only had 1.6 billion people on the planet 100 years ago. And I know what you're saying, but Mike, 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 Trump's president. <laughs> it doesn't matter who's president. I've been working under Clinton, Bush, Obama, and now Trump. And sure, there's problems to be solved. That's why we have you. You're going to be the ones to solve the problem and make this world even better. We're flourishing today, but you're going to make us even better. So when designing your life, don't believe all the hype. Think for yourself. Take responsibility for your own thoughts. 
Design lesson number four, sorry mom, you got to work your ass off. There's no way to get around it. In the 6,000 years of human civilization, hard work plus opportunity equals success. And doesn't mean monetary success, you know what I'm talking about, success in your relationship, success with your health, success in your job. You have to work hard at it. There is no magic pill, there is no easy way. You are not entitled to anything besides the value you bring to what you're trying to accomplish. And if you try, you will fail. What you've been taught for 16 years of your education is that failure is bad, A is good, F is bad, and life is exactly opposite. The faster you fail, the faster you learn because you don't want to fail again, so you learn faster. The definition of success is stumbling from failure to failure with no lack of enthusiasm. The worst thing failure would do is teach you something. Now when you fail and get knocked down and you decide to not get back up, that's quitting. That's mediocrity. Avoid mediocrity at all costs. Mediocrity kills more dreams than hopes can create. And so when designing your life, never, never, never quit. Keep working. Design lesson number five, last one. Compounding, compounding, compounding. You got to answer a question to get this one. Would you take $3 million today or would you take a penny if I doubled it every day for 30 days? Now, if you had your engineering calculators out, you do your math, you'd get $11 million if you took that penny and let me double it every day. That's the power of compounding. You'd leave $8 million on the table if you took that early gratification. Let me explain it a little differently. So my favorite basketball player is Michael Jordan. We used to emulate him, try to imitate him in this very gym when I was playing intramural basketball. When he was in the 90s, when I was going to school here, he was winning world championships. He won six in total. That guy got cut from his high school basketball team, didn't make it a sophomore year. Doubled down, came back his junior year, made varsity. It took him 13 more years of playing and practicing through high school, through college, into the professionals before he won his first championship. After he won his fourth championship, his private coach, not the team coach, but his private coach, asked him, hey, Mike, five, six, or seven, because he knew the next day Jordan's going to want to be on that court at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., or 7 a.m. to start practicing for the next season. Michael Jordan understood compounding. Change takes time, and we lose patience. If you want to make change, you make small, incremental changes that you can consistently perform, and over time, they turn into big life changes. I love what Bill Gates says about this. He says, we overestimate what we can accomplish in a year. We underestimate what we can accomplish in 10 years. Isn't that true? That's why New Year's resolutions don't work. You make these big old plans, and you try to make big change. It never works. You overestimate what you can accomplish in a year. You underestimate what you can accomplish in 10 years. I didn't get here by luck. I've been doing this job for 24 years, and I practice. In chapter two, I practice every aspect of my life, not just my job and trying to make money anymore. And so, when designing your life, be careful what you practice, because you're always practicing something, and you get really good at what you practice. So graduates, I hope you learned all this faster than I did. I didn't learn a lot of this until I was later on in my 30s. Life, living life by default is just accepting life as it show up and you think that life happens to you and you're a victim of your circumstances. But try to remember some of these five design lessons. Where you come from doesn't determine where you're going. Never stop learning. Think for yourself. Work your ass off and compounding. And you learn that life happens for you and life is beautiful. Faculty, trustees, staff, Dr. Hussey, keep making this a great university. Thank you for having me here. Fellow alumni, friends and family of the graduates, my friends and family, thank you for being here to support the graduates on what an unbelievable accomplishment. And to the 2019 graduating class of the Frank H. Daughter White College of Engineering, congratulations. Jalisco.